Well, good morning. I don't know about you guys. I felt a little bit uh, like I was floating during that song. And, uh, hopefully that's the case for everybody. It's good to get lost in worship. Amen? Amen. And so especially here on this Easter Sunday, it's good to be together. Happy Resurrection Sunday. And, um, you know, it's good to be together to celebrate all that God is doing. And if you forgot why you come to church, that's why you're at church, is to really celebrate uh, what God is doing. God has built an incredible church here in Dallas-Fort Worth that we get to be a part of. And whether it's your first time or your hundredth time, it's good to be together to celebrate and be in awe of God. You know, as I was thinking about today and all the things that I'm very grateful for, I just wanted to stop and give a quick thank you to a number of members in the congregation. Now, first of all, thank you to everybody because the church is what it is because of you. Amen? Amen. Uh, because we've chosen to worship God. Jesus said that he's going to build his church, but there's no guarantee that people are going to be a part of it. Um, it's perfect what God has left. It's perfect. The, the Bible's perfect. The forgiveness of sins is perfect. The Holy Spirit's perfect. The teaching, the code that God has given us to live by is perfect. Uh, but thank you for making it a part of your life so that we can have what we have here today. You know, the Christian life, it's described as a fight. And in fights, you get hit sometimes. And so in the Christian life, you're going to take some hits. And it's described as a race. You're going to get tired sometimes in the Christian life. But that's okay. It doesn't mean that it's not the Christian life anymore. It just means that you're going to have to learn how to get a little bit stronger, get a little bit more endurance. Take some hits, wipe your wounds, and stand back up, ready to face another day. Amen? And I do want to give a big thank you to the Hardings for their example, for Ron and Tracy. Thank you guys for your example of faithfulness over a generation. Um, a lot happens in a generation. And um, thank you guys for showing us what it looks like to be faithful through a generation. The Hernandezes uh, for your faithfulness. The McMurrays for your faithfulness. Thank you for your communion message. The De Castros, the Bushes, Judy Harding, faithful through the generation. A uh, couple, um, the Bushes, the Moraleses. And I think of uh, some of uh, some of the more uh, chronologically advanced, you know, members like uh, Richard and Scott. You know, these are awesome brothers. You know what I mean? And. Um, I think of everybody here, thank you, the Wartmans, for your example, of uh, being faithful. And, and I, you know, it's, it's amazing what we get to have. You know, for, if I miss anybody, sorry about that. For, for the younger guys like us, we're whippersnappers. You know, we, we got to, we're just, we're going, we're excited. We got to, but we got to continue to build our roots deep down so that we can continue to build something great for God. So thank you to everybody for your example and happy Resurrection Sunday. You know, as we jump in, I wanted to squash any confusion about Easter. Because we hear Easter, and then we hear Resurrection Sunday, and we're like, they're the same thing. Well, Easter was a, was a tradition that came in from, from Germany, I believe it was, in about the 1700s. And it was, the whole idea was it's around springtime, and spring things are new. There's a newness of life. The, the flowers come out. The, um, things start to grow and get colorful. And so a bunny or a rabbit or a hare would, would represent something that represented fertility or new life. And so the, the tradition was they'd build a little nest for the bunnies to have their babies. And uh, bunnies are, you know, cute. And it, in the, arc, the ancient days, it was like children were just, the point of a child was to get prepared to be an adult because you had to fight for your nation and your community and you had to get to work. And so later, children started to be like, wow, we need to give a great childhood to the kids. And so bunnies do a great job at that, of you know, bringing kids. And then we added chocolate and candy and all these different kind of things. And so long story short, Easter isn't found, you know, rabbits and bunnies and candies. That's not found in the Bible. But like any other tradition, it's okay to celebrate traditions as long as we don't put them above God. And we got to put God in his rightful place. First and foremost, today is happy Resurrection Day. Amen? And so... Also, in case you haven't noticed, we are two weeks into the three-month journey of springtime here in Texas, and uh, whoever has been blessed with, uh, with experiencing allergies is experiencing life to the full more than most people, and, uh, and we're two weeks in, guys. We only got, you know, about 10 more weeks left of spring, okay? So we're, <laughs> we're getting there, 15% done. But, you know, when I think about allergies, it's one of the prices that we have to pay here in Texas to get what we have in Texas. 
you know, about 86% of the land in Texas is agricultural. It's for agri agriculture production. That's, that's really, this is Texas that we, we produce stuff from here. There's incredible crop that comes out of Texas. The economic impact of the agriculture industry in Texas is about a $100 billion industry. And Texas is one of the largest exporters when it comes to agricultural commodities. And the price we pay for that is a lot of the pollen and a lot of the things that settles here. But it, it, came, it comes at a price to get the great crop, to get the great harvest, which is essentially what the Christian life is like. There is a great promise. I mean, the promise of heaven. We should be fired up about heaven every single day. I mean, to imagine the, I mean, Zeno did a communion last week about imagine yourself standing on the gold streets one day and hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant. Sometimes you just got to close your eyes in the craziness of life and you just got to say, man, one day I'm going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to open my eyes. I'm going to look down. The ground is going to be shiny gold. I'm going to think about crying a tear, and like right when it comes, it's going to get wiped away by the hand of Jesus. And it's just going to be, it's going to be like uplifted all this. You're going to get a new body in heaven. I don't know what that's going to look like. I hope I can fly, you know. I, I, I don't know. But I think we got, to, we got to dream. We got to be excited about this. But heaven is going to come at a price. Jesus paid the price, and it's also going to come at a price that we're going to have to pay as well. You know, I think about Jesus in his final week. And it wasn't really about his final week. Oftentimes people will say, well, it's the cross. That's what, that's what we're focused on. And man, the cross, yes, that was the culmination of everything that came where, where God did the miracle. At that point, Jesus took on the sin of mankind so that man could be forgiven. But really, if you go back to John chapter 1, and you don't have to go there, I'll just reference this. But in John chapter 1, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the Bible says Jesus was with God in the beginning. So when the world was getting created, when when animals were getting created, when the sky was being created, the sun and the stars and the, the vegetation and the animals in the air and the sea were being created, Jesus was there. He was there with the Father, and they were creating it together. If you read in Genesis 1, it says, let us make man in our image. It's God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus. They were having this perfect triune fellowship together, and they're saying, let's make man in the image of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So everything that's ever been created was created by Jesus. And at the beginning of his ministry, it says Jesus was with God. Through Jesus, all things were made. Without Jesus, nothing was made. In Jesus was life. That life was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Think about the challenge that Jesus had. He was the creator. He created mankind. He created people. He came to people to give to people. And he was rejected, he was beaten, he was persecuted, he went through all the challenges. He was misunderstood his entire life. And yet Jesus grew kind, loving, obedient, faithful, he was gentle, he was humble. What do you do when you're misunderstood? We, we see the perfection of Jesus. Jesus paid the price from the beginning that he stepped foot on. Think about his birth. He was born. There wasn't even a room in the hotel for him to be born. He was born in the barn with the animals. He probably opened his eyes and was like, moo moo. You know, <laughs> I don't know. What he's <laughs> you won't find that in the Bible. He probably said Abba. You know, that's probably what he said. <laughs> but it was really Jesus' whole life that he was giving. He was generous. He was kind. He was sacrificial. And the last week that, that we just got out of now is the Resurrection Sunday, but a week ago would have been the triumphant entry. It would have been Jesus. He would have been a well-known uh, figure by this time. He was, he was essentially a celebrity in a sense, in the sense that he had the recognition. People knew who he was. It didn't mean everybody liked him, but people knew about him. And he came in on the colt, and he came in, he entered Jerusalem, and they laid the palms down. That's why we get Palm Sunday, uh, which would signify the entrance of somebody who was, who was very important. And he came in and he entered Jerusalem, and this signified that Jesus was going to make his mark here in Jerusalem. And then on Monday, he went to the temple, and he, you know, he didn't have a case of the Mondays. Sometimes we're like, well, man, Monday is a rough day. No, we got to be righteous on Mondays. Amen, guys? That's, we come to church today, we get, we get focused for the week, and Monday, you sure be warmed up tomorrow. While the rest of the world is waking up and, you know, figuring out if they're happy for the week or not, we already know we're happy because we got God. 
and we're ready to hit the ground running on Monday morning. You know what I'm talking about? But Jesus, Monday, he went into the temple and he saw that, that people were, God wasn't the main attraction anymore. And he started flipping the tables and the money changers and he made a whip and he was patient and he didn't hit anybody, but he, he really set the standard that the temple, the, the, the temple is the place to worship God. We know that today our bodies are the temple. We should have worship deep down inside of who we are. And then on Tuesday, what happened? Jesus went and he taught on the Mount of Olives. And he taught them about getting ready. So this would have been last Tuesday. He was talking about getting ready for the, the day and the hour is unknown. So you got to be ready. You see, who you are sitting here right now is really who you are. If you're seeking God with all your heart right now, you really do seek God. If you think you're going to seek God next week, then that's a fantasy. You're making it up. If you think you're going to get righteous tomorrow, but today you're going to go finish some of the sin that you need to finish, that's really who you are. Whoever you are right now, that is really who you are. You can repent on the spot right now. You can make a decision right now to leave something behind. You could have a decision to have a conversation to forgive somebody right now if you need to forgive somebody. You could decide right now to let something go and to, to surrender whatever thing is hindering you and your relationship with God. You can do that right now. And that's what Jesus was teaching them on the Mount of Olives. He says, get ready because the day and the hour is unknown. Nobody knows. And then on Wednesday, there's, we don't really know what he did on Wednesday last week. I think he went to midweek probably, and he was, <laughs> took a time to just kind of rest. And, but then Thursday came around, and he had the Last Supper. And the Last Supper was where he taught the disciples to love one another the way that he loved. And he had them in this captivated, small, intimate group. And he says, guys, the way that I've loved you guys, you must love one another. I mean, this was a high call to love. He taught them that there was even some corruption within that group. He said, one of you guys is going to betray me. It was Judas. And he still loved them, and he was still kind to everybody. He was still gentle with everybody, teaching them that th it is a fight. It's going to be a fight to build what Jesus is going to leave. Come on, Jesus then, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prays for hours. And after he prays, he surrenders and then how does he surrender and how does his prayer get answered? He says, God, if there's a different way than me going to the cross and getting beaten and getting uh, tortured, if there's a different way, let it be done a different way. And then God answered his prayer by bringing some Roman soldiers with clubs and swords to capture him. And God said, my son, it has to be this way. And we don't like that answer. You know what I mean? Sometimes we're like, we've already scripted our story. This is what I'm going to do. This is what my life looks like. God, support me or get out of the way. And that's how we can act. Right. Right. Jesus was like, God, if there's a different way, let there be a different way. But God says it must be done this way. And Jesus says, okay, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. I'm ready to do the will of God. Wow. Not my will, but your will be done. Jesus then arrested. His friends desert him. He's all alone. This would have been good Friday. You know, good for us. But maybe it didn't feel so good for Jesus on good Friday. This was last Friday. Jesus was then brought out in the, in the morning time. He was flogged throughout the morning. He was brought with false witnesses, and he was put on trial, and he never sinned. And then at 12 o'clock, he made it all the way to the top of the Via del Rosa. He went down the Via del Rosa, went up to Calgary, Calvary, laid down. He was crucified. He was hoisted up at noon, and he hung there for three hours, and he forgave people. He shared his faith. He gave people vision. He cared about his family. He cared about people who were gambling and arguing over his clothes. And then he gave up his spirit at 3 p.m. The earth shook. People started to put their faith in him. People started to, this was last Friday. Saturday, people must have been confused. They were wondering what was going on. They were, there was a time of reflection. What have we done? Who are we? And then Sunday morning comes around. And that's where we are today, is the Resurrection Sunday on Easter Sunday morning. Let's pick up with what it must have been like here in John chapter 20. Let's go to John chapter 20. We're going to pick up here in verse 1. I wanted to kind of take us to where this situation must have been. You've got to ask yourself, what, what would you have probably been feeling if you had heard Jesus preach on Monday and then you saw him killed on Friday? I mean, maybe somebody was like, man, Jesus, you came in here and you disrupted my, my, my lifestyle. Man, this is how I make my money is 
I know it's wrong, but this is how I support my family. And Jesus is like, I don't agree with that then. You need to find a different way to do it. And maybe somebody was feeling some things on Monday and Tuesday. What do you think they felt on Friday when he was crucified? You know, sometimes we get so into our situations, we get so pigeonholed, we get tunnel visioned on this is the way it's got to be. And the resurrection should just give us pasture. The Bible says, come to Jesus. He's the gate, but he's going to lead you to the pasture. And so when you want to look at things the way that Jesus looks at things, you want to do things the way that Jesus does things, what happens is Jesus will give you a pasture type of vision. You ever gone to a, a pasture? It's like, where does this thing end? But you got to go through the gate to get there. So many people just want to do things their own way, and they won't come to Jesus and narrow down their life and get on the narrow path the way that Jesus says, because they don't realize that if you go and do it the way Jesus says, Jesus is going to give you a, a wide open space and life to the full. But first, you got to humble yourself, and you got to go through the gate, which is Jesus. you got to study the Bible. you got to know what Jesus says it means to be a disciple of his. You got you to gotta fit this into your schedule. If you're too busy to schedule the study the Bible, you're just too busy for God, probably. Because what do we worship often? We call God our thoughts. Well, I think about God. I'm, I'm kind of banking off of what I learned when I was a kid. Really? When I was a kid, I used to think all things, all kind of things were true that were never true. You find out so many things when you're older that, man, this isn't even really, this isn't really true. When I was a kid, I used to really think that there were a lot of bad guys in my house. And so we, had, we lived in a two-story house. And um, I would wake up. I don't know why I'd wake up probably like 2 a.m. every morning. And I'd wake up, and I'd just be like, i got to get to mom and dad's room. And if you would have asked me, I would have told you, there's bad people who really do live in our house. And I had the attic in my room, too. So that was like add a whole new element to it. And so I really, I really believed that. So I would, I would every, every, I'd wake up and I had like six corners I had to turn to get to mom and dad's room. And every corner I'd, I'd, I'd go up to, I'd, I'd like kind of go quick and I'd turn the corner and go like that. Man, I was fighting all kind of bad guys and it was real. It was so real for me. And man, I understood what it meant to get, to feel like I got to a safe place. And but that was never real. It was something I believed when I was, most people, a lot, well, a lot of people, they, they've never studied the Bible. And if you're here today, you've never really studied the Bible, man, study the Bible. Get with whoever invited you out. Take some time to study the scriptures. Find out what's real about Jesus. You're going to be blown away. Jesus was the best leader. He had the best insight. When you study the Bible, you see how Jesus handled situations. He used questions at times instead of putting people in their place. He was kind, he was gentle, he was faithful, and you can start to get vision that that's who you can be. But you got to study the Bible in order to find out who Jesus really was. John chapter 20, we'll pick up here in verse 1. It says, early on the first day of the week, so this is Sunday, this is the first day of the week here, we're Sunday morning. This is early for some people, but if you talk to Richard, this is like, pretty late right now. I think, you know, early in the morning would have been while it was still dark. So let's say before 7 a.m. in our vernacular, because it gets light about 7 a.m. Early in the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached for the tomb first, reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They did, still did not understand from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. You know, I wanted to paint this picture. You got Mary, and Mary was just curious. She was up early in the morning on Resurrection Sunday. And she went to the tomb, and it seems that it was only Mary who went to the tomb. You know, sometimes you got to wake up all by yourself and go seek Jesus all by yourself. And you're going to have something to talk to, really talk to people about. You're going to help people really know about something spiritual. 
man, if you miss, if you miss the first thing in the morning and, and spending time with God, usually that throws off a whole day. Man, Mary was up early in the morning. She ran to the tomb to go see Jesus. And she got there, and what she saw was the tomb was rolled to the side. And it seems like she got there and saw it, was in shock, did a 180, and went back to the disciples. And she said, guys, the tomb is open. you got to come see this. And then Peter and the disciple who Jesus loved, that's who John refers to himself as. (laughs) And he also wrote this account right here. And so he was like, I'm going to be humble and not say John ran faster than Peter. I'll just say the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so now Mary came and got them. And Peter and John are like, wow, we got to go see the tomb. And then John makes sure that he lets everybody know he outran Peter to get there. (laughs) And Jesus loves him. And so, and sometimes you got to say that to yourself. You're the disciple Jesus loves. You got to believe that. You got to believe Jesus loves you. If you just think Jesus loves people, you're, gonna, you're not going to individualize the promises and the things that God teaches about. He runs there. Now, he makes a, another point in verse 4. He says, both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And then he goes on. He bent over and looked at the, t- at the strips of linen. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him. You know, he just wanted to really emphasize, like, <laughs> I really did beat him. I'm going to tell you guys a couple times. I outran him. I got there first, and he was behind me. So now he gets there, but he didn't really have the courage to go in. So John seemingly gets stopped in his tracks. You know, some, sometimes you got friends who are more excited about something, and, and they'll get things going, but then they hit a wall. That's okay. He hit the wall. He looks over here, and then Peter comes from behind, <laughs> and he probably looks at John. And he's like, go in there. And he, then Peter goes in, and Peter goes in and stands at the tomb, and he sees the linen and the burial cloth. Now, finally, the Bible says, the disciple he loved came in as well. So now John comes in as well. They're both standing here looking where Jesus had laid. And they, were, they had a moment where they were just convicted. They were like, Jesus is not here. He made his bed, and he folded his clothes too. <laughs> the Spirit mentions that. I think we've got to mention it. So I think they were convicted for a second, but then they were like, where is he? what happened? And the Bible says that John believed when he saw. John believed because of what he didn't see. Think about that for a second. John had seen Jesus for three years. He had seen the miracles. He had seen him raise other people from the dead. And then he came to the empty tomb and he believed because of what he didn't see. You know, one of the things I think is so special about our fellowship is that people can come to our fellowship and they are going to believe because of what they do not see. People will believe because we don't, we don't support uh, sin. People are going to come here and they're going to be like, man, I believe because this isn't a place of people who are greedy. This isn't a prideful place. Then This isn't a place where people are trying to outdo one another. This isn't a place where people are conforming to the standard of the world. This is a place where people are transformed and they're living living new lives in Christ. We've got to continue to be a church that that excludes certain things that are wrong, that are sinful. We've got to not be a part of those in our lives. I don't mean the people. We need to invite everybody to come to this church. But man, if if you call yourself a disciple, we can't be living in things that the world's living in. People need to believe because of what they don't see, and they're not going to find a church that supports sin. They're going to find a church that's striving eagerly to do what is right. Well, let's keep on reading here in verse 10. It says, Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated there where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my Father, to your Father, 
to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told them he had said these things to her. You got Mary who had initially come and she went and saw the tomb. And then she left and got the disciples. The disciples came and did what they were going to do. And then they left, but Mary was still there. And Mary was just, she was weeping. And, and, and I, I got to give it up to the courage of the women. I think about the women's ministry. Uh, man, the women's days were awesome in the, the spur geographic sector. The women's day here was awesome. Uh, you know, I think about the moms. I think about the women. I, I think they just take things in differently than the guys. And uh, um, honey, I'm so grateful for you. Um, you have a depth and a, a, a love about you that um, God has gifted you with. And I'm very, very grateful to be your husband and that the kids get to call you mommy. Love you very much, honey. But Mary had this depth. She stayed there and the disciples ran and probably went to go, I don't know, talk about something else, you know, probably get everybody else, you know what I mean? And Mary was just there and, and she was like, I don't deserve to go in. The Bible says she just kind of peeked even after the, the brothers have been in and they left. And she gets the courage up just to look. And sometimes that's, that's what it takes. I mean, you just got to get the courage to look into what the Bible says. You just got to peek at this thing. And as, they, as she did, she saw, she started to see. She saw the two angels. And then she, she was weeping and the angels were like, what's going on? And she starts to have this conversation. She starts to pray in a sense. She starts to, and then after that, she turns around and sees Jesus, who she mistook for the gardener. Yeah. How common is Jesus? I mean, Jesus, the Bible says there was nothing to attract us to him. She looked at him and was like, sir, if you know where he is, tell me where the body is. Mr. Gardener. <laughs> and Jesus wasn't like, hey, you respect my title. You, you know, he, he wasn't like that. Jesus just called her by the name. By her name. Once he heard her name or she heard her name, she just got right into student mode. And man, I think it's so important for us here today is that Jesus is not sending a general message to people. You gotta put your name in here. Jesus is calling you by name this morning. He calls you by name on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, and he is waiting for you who are called by name to get into student mode, just like Mary did, and say, teacher, just show me what to do. And immediately Jesus started to give her some some direction. She just went and did it right away. And I'll tell you, if you want to have a life to the full, you got to take Jesus's direction. You just got to start doing it right away. Even if it doesn't make any sense, even if it's not how you grew up. You know, I was reading about what are the 10 top excuses that people don't change. I don't have enough time. Man, what if Mary was like, man, I'm busy. No, that's what her time was for right there. Some people don't change because they say, I'm too tired. It's too hard. I'll do it later. I don't know where to start. I'm not ready. It's too expensive. I've tried before. It didn't work. I don't deserve it. It's not a priority right now. Let Jesus call you by name today. And as you take the scriptures to heart and make them personal, you will start to do things and live a life that you never thought you could live. God will give you a testimony that's more powerful than any business strategy, that's more powerful than any TED Talk or YouTube video. And God will give you a testimony that not only moves your heart, but it'll move the heart of other people, and it will bring tremendous glory to our Father in heaven. Well, in verse 19, it says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, so that was the morning. They were together now in the evening. It says the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. Do you see the humanity of the disciples? Some people are like, man, the apostles, they were super apostles. They had superpowers. They didn't really face the hardships I faced. No, they were afraid, locked in their house from other, from other people. We're, we're all human. We all got fears. We've got doubts. We've got things we've got to work on. That's okay. Bring it all to the plate. Jesus wants to work with all those things. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Let me remind you of Gideon a little bit. Remember Gideon hiding in the wine press? And God comes and says, mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, me hiding? Isn't that who God is? He stoops down to make us great. 
he comes and he finds these guys hiding, locked behind the doors with no courage. And he's like, I'm sending you guys the way I was sent. And they're like, really? <laughs> he's like, I'm going to empower you to do it. And so the title of our lesson today is, I am sending you. Don't worry, it's two quick points. <laughs> I am sending you. I want to give you a simple challenge today. Let Jesus say that to you today. I am sending you. I believe God wants to send us out of these doors different today. God wants to send you back to work on Monday differently. God wants to send you back to your class different, to your family, to your friends. God wants you to be different. And he's sending you. And maybe you're sitting here right now and say, man, I'm fearful to change. I don't have the courage to change. Well, let me tell you, this same day, Jesus can send you to do something powerful. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Our first point today is raised to a new life. Romans chapter 6. I found a few pieces of good insight in this passage that I want to really give us to leave with. And whether you've heard this passage before or not, I'm going to read it like you've never heard it before. Because this is a powerful passage in the Holy Scriptures. It says here in verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means we die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You see, you read this passage and it's almost like this is the end result about what God wants for the state of your life. And many people read this and say, I'm not there yet. Or I have a hard time being here. What does this scripture say? It says, because we have life in Christ, should we go on sinning because there's grace now? It says, by no means. We shouldn't live in sin anymore because there's grace. Have you ever had that thought before? Well, the grace of God is so powerful, so it's just a little mistake. And I can have this little white lie, or I can have this little pet sin, and that's okay because there's so much grace. No, that's living in sin. Grace is there to cover mistakes. Grace isn't there to cover a deliberate choice to sin. And the Bible says here, it says, should we go on sin? The Bible says, no, we died to sin. You know, I read this the other day and I was like, man, but there's some areas where I'm like, man, I haven't fully died to sin. What do I mean by that? Man, I was selfish this week. I was inconsiderate of my wife this week. Does that mean I'm not, does that mean I didn't die to sin? Am I a Christian? Because the Bible says we have died to sin. But I was selfish last week. I was inconsiderate last week. Does that mean that I, I haven't died to sin? No, the Bible says that. Don't you remember when you were baptized? You were buried with Christ. Your sin was all forgiven. And you were raised with him to live a new life. And so now when you make mistakes, you don't just live in those mistakes and justify those mistakes. You get into those mistakes, and yes, we're going to make mistakes, but you repent of those mistakes. You apologize for those mistakes. You make amends for those mistakes because we do not live in sin any longer, and then grace covers over our mistakes when we truly have a heart of repentance. But I think about how do you, how do you know that you have this? Well, look here in, in verse 11, or in verse 8. It says, now if we died with Christ, because not everybody's died with Christ, you have to die to an old life. There's got to be a radical change in your life. If we've died with Christ, we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sins once, once for all. But for the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. How do you do this? You have to count yourself dead to sin. You know, you got to ask yourself sitting here this morning, if you were to make a, an honest assessment of who you are, have you counted yourself dead to sin? I'm not saying that you struggle with things or that there's temptation, but is sin off the table right now in your life? If not, there's got to be some major repentance today. The, Bible, the resurrection, it gives us the power to say, no longer am I going to live the old way of life I used to live. No longer am I going to be who I used to be. 
No longer my handle situations the way that I handle situations. Some people say, well, that's just how I grew up. That's just my nature. That's just my, my personality type. No, the Bible says count yourself dead to sin. And if you can decide to count yourself dead to sin, you can get the help you need. You can get the faith that you need. You can have the convictions you need to have to be raised to live a new life, to handle things in a very, very different way. You know, for me, guys, I'm not sitting here saying that I got it all figured out. There's things I got to work on. I'm dull in some areas. Man, I'm learning how to be a husband. I'm learning how to be a dad. I feel like sometimes I'm learning how to be a good disciple. And, but you know what the grace says? That's okay. As long as you're learning, as long as you're growing, as long as you're faithful, as long as you keep coming back to Jesus, you keep making Jesus your teacher, continue to be a student. The resurrection says you can do it, and Jesus says by name, I believe that you can do it. But you got to ask yourself sitting here today, have you counted yourself dead to sin? If you've already decided when you leave these doors that you're going to go live in some sin today, you're not dead to sin. You are still well and alive in your sin. That should set an alarm off inside of you. That should lead you to say, man, I'm not leaving here until I can get open with somebody, until I can set up maybe a Bible study, until I, I, can, I can figure out how to get into somebody's schedule who invited me out. I want to sit down and study the Bible. I want to have this new life that you guys are talking about because I don't have it because I haven't counted myself dead to sin. And let me tell you, when you're dead to sin, you start to really live for Christ. As you continue to read here, it says in verse 12, it says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. See, if sin reigns inside of you, the Bible says you let it reign inside of you. Because you haven't counted yourself dead. So that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. You see, the man or the woman who understands grace has done away with sin. I said, man, if there's a lifestyle of sin, guys, we're still going to make mistakes. I'm going to make, I'm going to probably make a mistake today. I'm going to, I'm going to sin probably later on today. It's Easter Sunday. Why in the world would I want to do that? I might be selfish. I don't, if you ask me right now, Brian, are you ever going to be selfish again? I say, no, I'm never going to be selfish again. <laughs> but man, sometimes I get put in a place and, and I find myself being selfish. I got to count myself dead to being selfish in that moment. I got to repent in that moment. I got to be alive in Christ and I got to appreciate the grace. You know, I believe that we need to be a church that is just grace junkies today. We got to love the grace. We got to know, man, I look at Paul's message in Romans 7. He's like, man, what a wretched guy I am. Paul, yeah, he's conquering the world and he's planting churches and he's raising up leaders. He's a mighty man of God and he's, but he says, man, I'm a wretched man. I need so much help. And how do you know if you've really been impacted by it? You know, I, was, I heard a story the other day, and uh, this guy, he was, I mean, what if I came in, in today and I was like, guys, uh, sorry, I'm, I, I was late today. I, um, aliens came down, and they took me up to space, and, uh, and then I got, um, you know, zapped away to a different universe, and then, um, and then on my way over here, a plane hit me, and then, sorry I'm late, guys. You guys would be like, dude, none of that happened, man. <laughs> but you know what's more impactful than getting taken up by aliens and hit by a plane is, is when you really get hit by God. When God really gets in your life. When you really have a taste of the grace. When you really get to know who God is. And so if somebody's like, man, I'm changed. I, you know, I, I've got God, but I just, I also have my sin. You never got hit by God, man. You got bumped by something, man, but that wasn't God. When you, get, when you get really encountered with God in that sense and the righteousness that comes from the Bible, and you count the cost, and you become a disciple, and you get baptized, and you get all your sin forgiven, you got God's spirit inside of you, you're a different man or a different woman. You're sensitive to sin, and yeah, you're going to make mistakes, but man, you get back up, and you confess, and, and you get basked in the grace, and now you have where we started with at the welcome today is resurrection power. Let's close out in Philippians chapter 3. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3. I like when God does that. Puts the same scripture in the service a couple times. 
And in Philippians chapter 3, it says here in verse 10, it says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not that I've already obtained all this or have already made, been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. You know, I read this and I think, man, how did Paul continue to move forward through all the challenges he went through? Our last point today is raise up to your calling. I believe that Paul was willing to go through it because he knew who he was for God. He knew who he was without God. And he knew the grace that God had called him to have. Paul says here that he wants to know Christ. He wants to know the power of his resurrection. That word power in the Greek is where we get dynamite. The resurrection is where we get anesthesia from. It's a, it's a newness of life. It's a raised. It's a, it's a freshness. Paul said, I want to know that. I want to know Christ, and I want to know his power. Now, I'm always hesitant to read the sufferings part because that kind of scares me a little bit when I say I want to know his sufferings. Because in my nature, I don't want to know those sufferings. I want to observe those sufferings, and I want to be thankful for them, but I don't want to know them. But then Paul goes on, and he says here in verse 12, he says, Here's one thing I do, though, and I believe that's one thing that we need to do as a, as a church family this morning. He says, I strain towards what's ahead. What's ahead for us as a church family? Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost. That's got to be in our scope this week. Yeah. Jesus said that he came to preach. That's got to be in our scope this week. Yeah. Jesus said that he learned obedience through, through spending time in loud cries and tears with God. That's got to be in our, in our scope this week. He answered his calling, and as Paul answered his calling, he knew that his past was so radical that he had to forget it at times so that he could press forward to go forward and win the prize. You know, for you, if you're here today and you're stuck in the past, I want to encourage you to study the Bible. I want to encourage you to get open. I want to encourage you to answer your calling. And as you step forward and have resurrection power and get to know it, you can say like the first century disciples were able to say, is yes, I had a lot of fear. Yes, I had a lot of uncertainties. But Jesus came to me and said, I am sending you. And I believe for each and every one of us here in the 21st century, you can say, man, maybe I came into church today with fear or with courage or maybe some even excuses today. But you can leave here today with the mindset where you put your name in here where Jesus says, I am sending you. You can study the Bible and you can be raised to have a new life. And as you do, you can raise into your calling and have real resurrection power. And to God be all the glory. Amen.